We're all called to come up to a higher place where we really, really are blessed with every blessing. Jesus said in Ephesians, we've already, be, already been blessed with every spiritual blessing in heaven. We're seated with Jesus. When we become a Christian, we're seated with him. So we might be physically down here with his body, but when we're born of his spirit, we're also positioned in authority and blessing with him in heaven. And in heaven there's no sickness, in heaven there's no disease, in heaven there's no poverty, in heaven there's no ageing, thank God. We can all be like, well, 30 year old again, whatever, <laughs> and be young at heart again. And um, there's no worries, there's no fear, and yet we go through fear, we go through troubles, we go through people hurting us in this, you know, there's no fighting in heaven, there's no arguing in heaven. <laughs> There's no jealousy in heaven. There's no, I'm not talking to you anymore in heaven. <laughs> There's no all kinds of silly things that we experience in life. It's a beautiful place. It's a beautiful uh, person called Christ that lives in us, that represents the real living God, who Christ is, he's God himself. We're called to come up to a higher place. You know, in the world, people want the best, don't they? They, they try to get the best job. They try to be the best sportsman. You know, the Commonwealth Games we've had. They always try to compete to be, I'm number one. You know, the boxer in the ring who wants to knock the other guy out. And there isn't any competition in heaven. Isn't that amazing? Nobody has to try and be better than anybody else. We're all equal. Imagine everybody having the same blessing that you all share. You know, when you're on the playground, hopefully you'll share your sweets. And, and, and when I used to have a bag of crisps, my friend used to put his big hand in and take all my crisps out like in one go. <laughs> and, and, but in heaven, there's none of that. Is there? In heaven, I'll go, take the whole bag. Jesus has given me another. But you know what I mean? It's different in heaven. There's a whole new arrangement. And Jesus wants us to be blessed with what the realization of every blessing, everything that we ever need is given in Jesus, everything, without any lack. So God wants us to come up higher. Um, you know, when we're looking at this, when God promises us things, God's promised us all of these blessings. God says you can have it all. Do you know why? Because Jesus paid the price for us. Jesus won everything when he went to the cross. He paid for us. So that we don't have to go through that. He took our place on the cross. So we could have a life. And he said what? Life to the full. Real life to the full. No more worries. Where's the money coming from to pay the gas bill? He will help make a way that we can't see a way. I've got hundreds of testimonies. Of money coming to our front door. Money being posted to me. Paying our mortgage off every month. People coming up to me and say, you need some help, here's some money. That's real. Amen. Doorbell goes and I'm just signing a document to sign the mortgage. And a person said, I've just been told to give my wages to you to pay your mortgage. That's our God. When we haven't got a way, he is the way. And he wants us to have this abundant living. The real life is worth living in Jesus. We've got an enemy and he's called the devil. He's called the wicked one who tries to destroy people, who tries to lie to people and they listen to him. Adam and Eve listened to him at the beginning. They lost the blessing, didn't they? Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. You shall be like God if you eat from that tree instead of that tree. You can have more knowledge and be like God. And that's the world, the people in, the, in, in society... They want to be clever and there's nothing wrong with education. There's nothing wrong with the degree and, and all that kind of thing to get on in life and to have a good job. But I'm saying that Jesus, when you have him, you can have a better mind. You can have a mind that's Christ's mind. You can have wisdom that you never dreamed you could have. 
You can have understanding that you never could dream of. You, you can be, wow, I know things that I never knew before. And I didn't need to learn it. <laughs> you know, you heard about Solomon. Supposedly the wisest person on earth, but the only wisest person on earth was when Jesus walked the earth. But in his day, he was the wisest person on the planet. And he was rich. He, he had wisdom to relate to people in wealth. And he was the richest man on the planet. But he went silly. He listened to people who was influenced by the enemy, by the devil. And he lost everything. Because he failed to understand what he was given was for everybody and not for himself. And we want to make sure that when God tells us he's going to bless us and he's told us, we don't have to try and make it happen for ourselves. Because it's by his spirit, his power comes and lives in us. When I was told to do a video company called Zureal Media to film weddings and events and things... I was redundant six times in engineering. I used to make buses and trains. I used to make jewellery. All kinds of stuff I used to make as a tool maker. And because of the climate, because of the government of the day with Maggie Thatcher trying to stop manufacturing, didn't like coal mining, didn't like engineering, she said we will be a nation of shopkeepers, of bankers and office workers. So she started to shut the coal mines, shut down the fa factories. And then the only jobs you could have was a two-year job at the most. And then you had to reapply for your job to get the pay lowered down every time. You didn't get an increase. And everything changed. And I was redundant six times. And I said to Pauline, gosh, this ain't working. And I said to God, this ain't working. And he said, Zareel Media is what you're going to call the filming that you've been doing all of these years, part-time, do that. And so I did. The redundancy pay I had bought two cameras. I spent all my money. And Paul was going, what? How are we going to pay the mortgage? Have you spent all your redundancy money? I says, I'm trusting in God. He told me. God's promised me. My dad in heaven promised me. And so I, I set up a business and I started to form a website and, and had some advice from people who had done business. But I didn't have any orders. <laughs> I didn't have one booking. And I had about three months of money left in my savings to pay the mortgage. And I was signing the dotted line of a contract with another building society because the interest rates were lower. And I, I was almost lying to the building society man. You're about to sign this document and you are signing that you're able to make this payment. And I'm going, oh my gosh, I'm signing and there's no money in the bank to pay the money. <laughs> and just as I was signing, the doorbell rang and a neighbour in our street, another Christian lady said to Pauline who answered the door, I'm giving you my wages to pay your mortgage. And Pauline couldn't believe it and she says, go ahead, Bri, go ahead, Bri. Oh, okay. Yes, I've, I've signed the document. That's happened loads of times. You've got to trust God. Because I can't make things happen. You can't make things happen. When God tells you, let him do it. That's what the message is. Have a different spirit. Not the fear. I haven't been and you haven't been given a spirit of fear and trembling. You've been given what? A spirit of power, of love and a sound mind. So when you become a Christian, you have this ability to overcome fear, to overcome what happens in the world. We've got a father who looks after us, who provides for us, who puts food on the table. Can I tell you another story? Another story about a man in 1900-something who was um, a, a, a minister of a church and God told him to stop being a minister of a church and go on the streets of Bristol he said, I don't want to do this ministry anymore because there's another leader in your church. You, you can go and be released. And I want you to look after little orphan children on the streets of Bristol. Do you know what his name is? George Mueller. George Mueller is called a man of faith. He heard God's voice. He was paid a wage by the church. 
I don't get paid, by the way. <laughs> I've got a business and we, we've got a ministry. But he was paid a regular wage. And uh, so he said, yes. He went out onto the streets. He had a home, a vicarage, which he had a, a, a gift of. The, the church gave him that. It was in a small building. But he actually sold that. The other, the other minister coming in had another big house. So they sold that house. And he's living in a small apartment somewhere. And he was trying to reach on the streets in the Victorian times. You know, you saw the film, maybe an old film, a black and white film. And the, you know, you saw that film where the, the little boy goes up and he says, more soup. Well, there's plays on telly about this. More? He says, more? You want more? Because food was scarce in those days. And the young children roamed the streets. Little tiny children was on the streets begging for food. That's how bad it was. And George Muller fed them with what money he had. And then God started to bless him. And he had a house given to him. And then he had about 50, maybe, or maybe at the end he had hundreds and hundreds off the street in all of these different houses all over Bristol. But God gave every one of those houses. And the funniest story I've ever heard, they was all in the living room, a big house room, and a big table, and it's all sitting around the table with these breakfast bowls, you know, and a spoon, and a, it's a wooden table and big wooden chairs. And George Muller st stood at the top of the table looking at all these little ones, and they was going like this, there ain't no food in the pantry. What's he going to do? Because they sneaked in the pantry and I saw there's no food. And they, what's he going to do? And they're laughing. And they're going, oh, this, he, he believes in God. How is he going to feed us? And so George Muller stood up and he prayed for what we're about to receive. We are truly thankful. And all the little ones going, what, mister? What, mister? Are you, are you all right, mister? And he went, no, you're going to be fed. And the moment he sat down, the doorbell, you know, old fashioned, they pull the string and the door goes ding, ding, ding in the hallway. And he runs to the hallway and he opens the door and there's a lorry that turned over at the bottom of the road and all the foods come out on the road. And he said, you can have all the food. I know you've got all these little ones in your house. You can have all the food. Some of it's okay. It's still in the packaging. And they had about six weeks of food. <laughs> and he, the miracles after happen and miracles happen and for years he was blessed by God because he trusted in God but what I want to say is that not all of us have that kind of faith not all of us have that ability when things are hard for us we try to help God and sometimes we can think the wrong things and go well I know God said this I know God promised this happen. You know, well, why isn't it happening? It's, you know, God promised us, you know, a church. God promised a living well church, a building, you know, years ago. And um, we was in the social club, a, a pub. We met in a pub. Well, a bar was and a drink. We, we worship Jesus in this room upstairs above these drinkers. And some of them came upstairs and they was drinking their beer. And, and they was putting their pints down as coming to be prayed. And they said, why do you want to come here? We said, well, we, got, we ain't got a building. God's told us to come. And so for seven years, we, we, we had a church in a pub. And these people were getting prayed for. And they couldn't understand why wacky Christians would want to be with them because they're getting drunk and swearing. And we was blessing them and praying for them instead and helping them. And one man, the doorman, he got free from alcoholism. He couldn't stop drinking before we got there. And he used to open the door for us in the mornings early and we'd take our equipment up the stairs and the fire escape and all kinds of ways. And he came in the middle of the meetings to pray, you know. He was broken. He kept, oh, I can't be, I'm, all my money's going on drink. And we, he came in the middle of the meeting. We all stopped and we all surrounded him and prayed. And he got healed. Yeah. He got set free from having drink yeah. problems. Yeah. And he was still pulling pints, but he didn't want to drink them because no. Jesus took that desire away. A miracle happened. We was there for six, seven years. God, you promised us a building. Zoe's got a picture of the building she drew. And my grandson's got a picture of the building in a different kind of shape. Because the way, the, and Zoe had a dream, the building, and so on. Anyway, we went to a community centre because that shut down. And we was in a tiny little room, like a, a small classroom. And only seven of us could fit in there. And we had that for nearly two years with the COVID 
And I, I was going like this. This is why I'm saying this. I was going, Jesus, you've promised us a building. We've been on the parks. We've been in the, in the city centre. We've been preaching on the streets. We've been in a social club. We've been in a community centre. We want a building. And I started to doubt God. And I thought, gosh, Lord, we had a, we had a fund for the building. And uh, somebody in the church gave us a £100 gift in the funds. And I thought, we need a million. <laughs> how, is, how is that going to happen? <laughs> and, and I began to doubt God. And, and then God was telling me, be careful. When I said I'm going to provide for you, don't try to make it happen yourself. You'll never do it. It's too big for you. And so... The thing was that we not to limit God is the word. We have to have another spirit. The Bible teaches of a different spirit or an excellent spirit. The Bible talks about a positive attitude. Always being positive and have faith in God. Have trust in God. And we was like, well, we were worn out trying to find a building. We was, we was going around in the car every weekend. I was looking for factories, for warehouses, for any building it was for let and not going. We can't afford that. You know, 20 grand a year for a little building like bigger than a shed because it used to be a factory. And God was saying, you just trust me. So I began to doubt in God. I began to doubt in him. And I was going, God... What's the point? What's the use of doing this anymore? I was almost giving up on what the Living World Church was. How can this happen? And I was saying the wrong things. I was speaking negative things. Lord, you've promised us, but you, it's like we, we've not even answered our pretty. You begin to doubt God and say the wrong things. And Jesus was saying, be careful that you don't doubt me because I will promise and I will make it happen for you. And so, for us, after I began to realise that we're still a church, even though we haven't got a building, it's not the building, it's the people of the church, and we still have a Zoom meeting where we can connect with people over COVID, and now we're linking to Africa and to Pakistan sometimes and to Indian people, and, and we, we're linking to people, and so God has built something additional, and... and the problem was that when you don't get your prayers answered in the time you think, you can start thinking the wrong things. Well, have I done wrong? It seems to be such a failure. I feel hopeless. And we can actually begin to limit God. And you know what the word limit means? It's a curse. When we speak negative things, the word curse means limiting it means we don't really trust in God anymore. His promises are then postponed. His promises can be delayed. You know the story of the people in, in Israel who came out of Egypt. Moses went in and rescued them. He was sent there after running away from Pharaoh. And he spent 40 years of himself learning to come away from all the things he had been taught by the Egyptians and he was with the Midianites and he learned to really depend on God himself. And then the, these people were slaves for 400 years, the Israelites, because they offended God eventually. They distrusted him over a period of time. It was 400 years and they started to get broken and the, the new... Um, Pharaoh didn't know the previous Pharaoh and Joseph and all those people who had favour with God and, and blessing of God. And so they became slaves to the circumstances. And there was grumbling along the way. And it was 400 years before God decided to hear their prayer and deliver them. It's a kind of example that we've got to be careful what we say. We don't want to delay our blessings. And, and the people of God here, the example is like another spirited people. You know, when the children of Israel was going into the promised land after 40 years, there was only two people. Only Joshua and Caleb. Joshua and Caleb was the only ones who believed that God was going to deliver them into this land full of milk and honey. And the grapes were like golf balls. 
And the fruit was massive. But the people were giants. There was big people in the land. And they sent the 12 spies in. And I don't know if you heard the story, but they sent 12 people in to go on ahead of the Israelites. And Joshua and Caleb has faith. What God said we will do. We will honour God. And the rest of them came back moaning and grumbling. Grumbling to God. It's terrible. If we go in there, we'll be murdered. We want to go back to where we've come from. We want to stay in our comfort zone where we're happy. with lentil soup. They was doing that most of the time. They was in the wilderness. Lentil soup is what they desired instead of the manna. Sweet bread from heaven every day. And then quail came in the camp and they had bird meat to eat. And God looked after them. And this rock, the water came out of a rock in the wilderness. And none of their shoes worn out for 40 years. The children's clothes somehow grew with them. <laughs> Oh gosh, our children, every six months had to buy a new set of clothes for them. And so God looked after them, but they still rejected God's promises. And the simple message is, we've got to really develop our expectation for the future. God has promised us the church, a bigger building than this, a powerful anointing that we're coming into, blessing. We don't want to... Uh, go into negative things in the transition period. That's what happened with the children of Israel all of those years. They, was, they, they, they had a cloud over them to, to stop the sun, overwhelming them with the heat in the desert, in the wilderness. They had a fire by night to keep them warm. God did everything for them. And yet they still moan, moan, moan. Moses, you're not our leader anymore. They complained against Aaron and Moses all the way through. But these people that was remaining was allowed to go in. But the spies, gosh, they didn't believe. Ten of them didn't trust God. But two of them did. And that was allowed. Only two people went in to the blessing out of all the million plus people. Only two people actually got the blessing of God. We need to learn. It's the same in the New Testament. There's people in the New Testament that try to help God and try to do it. And then God's patient, He's kind, He's the bestest dad you'll ever have. He's the one who waits for you to learn to believe his long suffering it's a, it's a really a time whenever we have spoken negatively we've got to say sorry god i've been wrong I've, I've misunderstood you i've misjudged you i thought it would happen like you said on that particular time scale my time scale isn't your time scale and i've got to be Patient because God's plans come to pass in perfect time. Just when you least expect it, God turns up and he blesses you anyway. So it's a time for us to learn. We looked at uh, Gideon, didn't we? Yeah. Gideon, this man of God. The uh, people is attacking the, the tribe of Israel. The land was overcome because, again, the people of Israel, they're in the promised land. Now they're in the land, but they still turned against God. They had all the things they needed. The danger is when we become self-sufficient, we no longer turn to God. It's like me and my dad. He gave us pocket money, my sister and me. It's like, um, you know, he's earned all his living, his, his window cleaning all over Chelmsley Wood. And on a Friday, a sack full of money. Every Friday, a sack full of cash, old-fashioned five-pound notes, big notes. And uh, there weren't pound coins, there's a pound note. And my dad put this big bag of table, like a sack on the table. And I was only just the level of the table, I could see this man of cash. Oh my God, imagine me going to my dad, ah, keep your pocket money. I'm going to earn it myself, I'm going to have a paper round. I'm not, and I'm not even old enough to have a paper round. <laughs> That's what the children of Israel was doing. 
We don't need him. We've got everything we need. We'll do it ourselves. That's the danger of the church. Self-sufficiency is bad. We are only to depend on him. This is what happened to the um, children. The Midianites were uh, oppressed um, for seven years. And and then the angel came to this man called Gideon. This is um, Judges 6 in the Bible. And um, Gideon, an angel of the Lord came and sat down under the fir tree, which is by Epaphra in the land of Joash. Uh, and Gideon was freshing the um, grain, and the angel appeared to him and said, The Lord is with you. And he said, This, you, Gideon, and I could say this to you guys, you are strong. He's gracious to you. The Lord said to him, be gracious with me, my Lord, and if the Lord is with us. Why has these evils found? Because the angels appeared to him, and he's shocked. But the angel was trying to encourage Gideon. He's going to be called. He's going to have a job to do. God's going to bless him. God's going to rescue all of these millions of people through a few people. Isn't that amazing? They were all worried and scattered all over the nation. And then Gideon's up halfway up a mountain or a hill and he's doing this work, grain that he had. And every time he got the crops, the enemy would come and steal away from him. That's what was happening for seven years. They got so many blessings, but the enemy came and stole it. That's what happens to us sometimes when you don't realize it. We have a blessing of God and somehow it's like your bag's got holes in it and the money's all drained. And you don't know why. We've got to say, Lord, what's going on? And the angel's trying to say, go in this your strength and you shall save Israel out of the hand of Midian, for I have sent you. And then Gideon says, well, be gracious with me, Lord. How shall I save Israel? How shall we build a living well church? How can we do that? How can that work out? How are we called to the nations? How are we called to be prophets to the nations? you get got amazing prophets. How can the, the people that's been prophesied with Canon Andrew White, how is that going to work out, the ministry you've been given, the, the clarification? It's because the Spirit of God is in us. He's called us. So don't think the wrong things over your prophecy. Don't think, well, that's not me. I can't do that. I can't win Muslims to Jesus. I can't do that. I had the same prophecy. God, it's only now that the prophecy is in my life has started to happen. He's saying, how can I, I'm the least, I'm the least of um, all my brothers and sisters, of my dad's family, I'm nobody. They don't even like me in my own family. I'm I'm nobody, dad. That's how he feels. And the angel said, the Lord shall be with you, and you shall strike Midian as one man. One man was able to bring deliverance to millions of people. Every one of you could have a call on your life to rescue other people around you. Just one of you, when you have Holy Ghost in you, when we have the power of God in us, that's what can happen. But we've got to believe it. we really got to believe that. And then Gideon's saying, he's not sure of what he's just been told. Well... If now I've found mercy in your eyes and you will do this for me as you have spoken, don't depart from me. I want to cook you a meal. Let's have a meal to you. I want to find out a bit more about this person who's saying this stuff. So he's, he's talking to an angel. Uh, will you remain? Uh, and, uh, uh, and Gideon went away and made uh, bread and so on and had a fine flour and, and poured a, a soup and so on and uh, he, the angel of God says, take the fresh unleavened cakes and put them on that rock and pour out the broth close by. And he did. And the angel of the Lord stretched out the hand of the rod that was in his hand and he touched it and the unleavened bread and fire came and burnt the offering. Fire came out of the stick that the angel touched the bread with him. So the angel didn't need food, did he? <laughs> <laughs> the angel didn't need food. God's saying, when you try to do stuff from me, it's filthy rags, it burns up in my fire. 
he says that. Stop trying to help me. I've got, I'll bless you. I'll give it. I'm the provider. I'll bless you with food. I'll bless you with clothing. I'll bless you with joy and peace. And Don't try to make yourself happy. You'll end up worn out. <laughs> and and, and uh, Gideon doubted God. And he doubted what he heard. I'm just going to paraphrase because of time. And so Gideon decided to say to God, well, if you did say that, make this fleece a, a, a lamb skin, a sheep skin with fur on it. Make it be all wet tomorrow morning because it's a desert. If this skin, the fur is all wet, I know you've spoken to me. A fleece. It's called a fleece. So there's the lamb skin overnight and he's sleeping away. Next morning he gets up and it's soaking wet. And that should be enough. God's answered his prayer. And then, oh, but Lord, please don't be mad at me. This time, I want to try you again. One more time. If all the ground around it is wet and that skin is dry, then I'll believe you. That's how we are. You know, Lord, you've said all these wonderful things to me. Now, if you prove it to me before it happens to me, then I'll believe it and then I'll be happy. And that's how we are. You got it. God doesn't need to be tested. What he says he's going to do. And so God's honoured him. God honoured... I used to pray a prayer of a fleece. I'm not going to mention it. Where a pigeon went upside down three times in a loop. <laughs> Have you ever seen a pigeon do loop the loop? They can't. It's impossible. And I said, Lord, if it's going to happen like you said for the prophet who wrote to me and, um, that I'm going to be in a certain place, I'm going to go home and so on in a certain time, um, please let a pigeon fly past my window at 8 o'clock in the morning and do a loop and a loop and a loop. And I thought, no way. And I opened the curtain, and at the same time, a pigeon, woo, and it vroom, vroom, three times. I went, whoa, <laughs> a pigeon doing a loop the loop. I've never seen that before in my life. They can't, it's impossible. How can a pigeon fly upside down like that, like a jet engine? I thought, oh my gosh, God is real. And I started to believe. <laughs> And so, what happened with this man of God? Gideon tried his best to say, yeah, you're going to do it, God, right? You're going to do what you said. I believe you now. You've done it twice. One night the fur was soaking wet and the next night it was dry. I believe you. But then do you know what he did? He tried to help God. He thought, well, these enemies, there's thousands of them. And God told him just one man, didn't he? You will be the deliverer. One man. So Gideon got all the army together, 30,000 people of all the Israelites, to try and fight these maybe 500,000. And there's Gideon thinking, hey, I've got it, I've got it, I've sorted it. There's all these people now. We're going to win, we're going to win. And then God spoke to him. He says, Gideon, you better trust me. Look at those 30,000 people are they really going to fight with you? They can't even hold a shovel in their hand. They're so weak. How are they going to fight this? Yeah, but there's 30,000 of them. With what we've got, we think we can please God. We think we're going to do... Yeah, but I've got a fast car and I can get there on time. And oh, my. And, and, and the little sister Gideon, you don't need 30,000 people. You just need the ones that I'm telling you. You to have so we reduced the number with it three thousand. He come down to, he came down to three thousand men, and God says, "Oh my gosh, Gideon, what are you doing? You've had two chances with the fleece. I just need you to listen to me. Take them to the water bank where the river are, where the river is, and watch those of them." who, how they drink water, because they didn't have cups. You know, when you get a river, you stoop down and maybe you, you scoop the water up and you go, and you go, and, they, and then some of the men, you know what they did? They put their mouths in and they lapped up like a dog because they was desperate for water. And so what happened was, God says, note those people, the ones that are just lapping with a hand but the ones who are really putting their whole head in the whole mouth in the water I want them do you know why because they really are serious they really are thirsty and they really will out of desperation fight for their lives that was the test you want people around you that are good for you they're not going to walk away from you when you need them 
So God says, on top of that, when you win this battle with 300 of these people compared to thousands of my enemies, I get the glory. That's what it's all about. That we give him all the glory. So we want to reverse the doubts because that becomes a curse. When we don't believe God, we are limiting him. We're actually saying, well, I can do it myself like Gideon did, like um, the uh, people of Israel, apart from Joshua and Caleb, who had been described as having a different spirit or another spirit. And there's a person also had an excellent spirit. And we want to be people who really are having the excellent spirit. And we need to say, Father, if there's anything in us that's caused us not to come into all the blessings that you've allowed us and promised us to have. We want to say, Lord, if that's me stopping you from blessing me, I really am sorry. And I want you to help me now. If I've hindered you working through my life to bless my family, to uh, provide for me through whatever you've called me to do, then, and if I've stopped you, I want to say, sorry. I am wrong. I now say I'm going to trust you and I ask you to help me and put this back in your hands. So that's what we need to do because revival is coming. Big things are going to happen in the Living More Church. There's going to be a work going on here that we can't see yet. And God's trying to encourage us. You know, you're amazing. It's amazing. God's encouraging us. All of you are amazing. So Father God, we thank you. That we want to say, Lord, it's a critical time to really change and have a, 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 a change of our hearts, Lord God, and let faith rise up. We want to be careful what we think in our hearts and what our minds are saying and our, our mouths come out. Remember I shared about the pastor of a church. He was called to have a brass band. And what happens was you get the promises, but you don't see the full promise. There's another part of this where you only see a partial blessing. And what you try to do, you think, well, if God says that, why not it all happen in one go? The pastor of a church, Pensacola Revival, remember that? Remember Pensacola Revival? Steve Hill? The pastor of that, he was sharing, that um, he was told to, in his church, he had about 15 people who could play, play brass instruments. He all told him, why don't you allow us to come and worship with the brass instruments? So he, he prayed and the Lord says, yes, set up a party platform, maybe one of the sides of the platform, and, and make a section for all the people with trumpets and trombones and all these brass instruments. So he did that. He spent thousands of dollars making it in a certain shape to make the sound come out better. It was really beautiful. And then he, well, the next Sunday when it was open, one person with a trumpet came and he looked, and all the congregations looking. There's one man in his great big place on his own, playing his trumpet. And he thought, this is a joke. And the next morning, the next sunny morning, he goes, he goes past this place where the brass band's supposed to stand. And he went, what a joke. Huh, gosh. You said you'd do this. You said you'd do it. What a waste of time. That's a waste of space. Do you know what those words are? Those words are cursing words. Those words are not receiving the blessing of God. And then God told him in the meeting, God said to him, you're the one that's stopping your blessing. Every time you walk past that thing, you're negative about what you expect. You're negative. I didn't say I'd give them all in one go even though there's enough in the meeting. And anyway, when he repented, he said, Oh God, I bless this area. I bless this church building. I bless the people that you've allowed me to be a leader of. I bless their families. I bless all the instrument players, the, do the doormen, the car park attendant, the people that work in the canteen and the kitchen and the cafeteria. I bless the people on the sound desk. I bless the people on the cameras. He started to bless the building. He started to bless his wife and his own two sons who he had said bad things in, a, in an anger years ago. And the Holy Spirit said, they're not what you say they are. They're what I say they are. You better start blessing your children, blessing your grandchildren, and blessing your home, and blessing your dad, and blessing your... And so he started to have a different spirit. And the next Sunday, 
the place is packed out, there's not enough room. There's more brass instrument people that he didn't realise has got trumpets and they all came in and there's an overflow of brass instruments in the church. <laughs> so let's have a good example. And, and I want to say, whoever's watching this, it may not be for any of us here, but I know that God wanted me to share this. That if any of us, and I'll be repenting myself actually, and say, Father God, we want to repent of any words that we've had or spoken that's actually been negative towards people. Our families are blessed. Our children are blessed. This sanctuary is blessed. Our relationships are blessed. Our homes are blessed. Our cars are blessed. Our ministry is blessed. Our jobs are blessed. Even if we haven't got one yet, our time is blessed. Our worship is blessed. I'm blessed. We're all blessed. And I bless them. And I forgive those people who have spoken negatively against me. I forgive them. And I bless them. And Lord, I declare that every word curse that I've spoken or anybody else or any thought that's been limiting me, that's been negative, I repent and I pray, Father, a blessing on all my enemies. And so, Father God, I pray that now the manifest blessing will be upon all of us, the, the people of God, whoever's listening to us, even if you're not a Christian, you can be blessed by simply coming to Jesus right now and saying, Jesus, I'm a mess. I need you. And even if you think you're a good person, Jesus will show you there's only one person who's perfect, and that's himself. So you can come as you are right now, and you can say, I need Jesus. I want that life to the full. I want what this crazy preacher has been talking about today, and I need Jesus. So if you want to come, come to the front of the telly, what a phone you have, just say your prayer. I need Jesus. I turn away from all the negative stuff I turn away from Satan I turn away from the wrong things I've been doing and I turn to Jesus now I want Jesus to be my Lord my Savior and I want the best dad in the universe who is the Father God in heaven and if that's you just pray in your own words and receive the best blessing of all your life Christ himself you must be born again born of his spirit that means Holy Spirit comes and makes a transaction in your heart when you pray that prayer and he becomes real. He starts to witness with your heart that you belong to your Father in heaven. So Father, I thank you that there will be fruit from this message because you've told me that you get all the glory, that you want to bless your people. So Father God, we repent of every way we've limited you in our personal lives, in our corporate lives, in our connections with people or family members or communities or wherever it's been done. We pray, Father, break that now. We want no more limits on the people of God, on the church and the ministry you've given us. We want the Birmingham House of Prayer, the Living World Church, Fathers Are Dancing, Prison Ministry UK, all the things that you're about to do we don't know about. We want it full on. We, we need the fire of God. We need the revival fire. We need the presence of God that when people come in the building, they will be changed by your spirit, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Thank you Father. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. I've got a Savior. He lives right inside of me. Oh, yeah. His name is Jesus. He means so much to me. Oh, yeah. He went to the cross to pay for our sin. 